Good morning. Welcome to the Inner Source Summit Spring EU 2020. Uh, and of course, we're doing this virtually for the first time because of the COVID virus. So uh, thank you very much for coming. And we hope that you will find today and tomorrow both informative and not too taxing. Um, and I wanted to start by showing you what I look like so that uh, you feel a little bit of human connection, even though we're going to be doing the slides next. So um, thanks very much for coming. Thank you to everybody that helped put this on. And Let's get going. Hi there, and happy Intersource Day. Um, we always say happy Intersource Day. I, I use this as my splash screen every year for this talk, um, but I also say it often to my Intersource uh, Commons colleagues. Um, we're, we're starting to say it to each other uh, because every day is really Intersource Day. So I'm really, really happy to have a little time to share with you the history of the organization, uh, how we came to be having these summits, some of the projects that we're working on, and um, to kick off this day. So thanks so much. Don't forget that um, you, know, you can reach out and talk to us at any time in Zoom chat during this event. Okay, so first of all, please, we're begging you to be patient with us because we threw this together quite quickly. And we expect that there will be no problems, but if there are, trust that we're working on a fix we don't have a fail well uh, splash screen, unfortunately, um, and we are dependent on pieces of software like Zoom, but um, we are here and we will you know, continue during the hours that we promise to be around. So hopefully if anything goes wrong, you'll hold on and not turn off the, the dial. Um, we are gonna try to approximate the hallway track because we know that most people really like the hallway track in our conferences and in most conferences, frankly. So to that end, we will be on chat throughout the event. And when I say we, all of these talks are pre-recorded so that I can be on chat and focus on answering your questions rather than on producing a good talk. So if you look at your chat window right now in Zoom, you will find me there waiting to answer questions or just generally um, chit chat about this process. Um, we are gonna be sending a survey out and the survey is uh, also tied to how you get your t-shirt because we need both your mailing address and your t-shirt size. So please do take the time to fill out the survey and um, we would love to hear what you think, what worked, what didn't, what you'd like to see more of or less of. And now to the talk. So I'm gonna start by talking about ownership culture. I have been involved in software engineering for 30 years now in my career. And I can tell you that ownership culture is very pervasive in software companies of a certain age, and even in companies that don't think of themselves as software companies, but are dependent on software that they write internally. So ownership culture is a strategy that came into vogue very strongly um, under the tutelage of companies like Microsoft and Apple, who sort of set the tone for the way that software engineering is being done today. It involves anointing a small group of people to become experts about a given piece of software within the larger company. And the fact that they have expertise, and in some companies they're not even allowed to talk about their expertise to other members of the um, software community or well, anybody in the company, um, that, that kind of specialization gets you some known benefits when you first institute it. People take pride in the work. They, um, they feel you know, tight kinship with the other members of their team. Um, and so there are some positives to it, but over time, it becomes a net negative because human nature is to become cliquish and you um, break down a lot of really other helpful behaviors when you overinvest in ownership culture. So one of the first things that happens is you start noticing bottlenecks in the process of producing software. If you have to wait for a feature request to be fulfilled, or if you have to result, uh, resort to um, executive escalation to prioritize feature requests, you probably have a broken ownership culture. Um, the, in, in inner source, as in open source, the way that you deal with a need is you go research the code that you need to change 
and you suggest with a pull request the change that you would like to see. You know, you scratch your own itch, as we say famously. And that means that your resources are being fully utilized, but it also means some other things, like your company is starting to understand in a cross-functional way how the software is uh, actually works, which can be really useful, let me tell you, if you have a big upset in your um, community and you need to, you know, move people around. They, they will come up to speed a lot faster if they've already learned a little bit about the code. Um, but another thing that happens in ownership culture is there starts to be blame instead of collaboration. So lots of, I can't get my job done because of you kinds of things. Lots of um, beliefs about other people's work that may or may not be true. None of this is good to get everybody pulling in the same direction. You can see very clearly how that might be a problem. And then, of course, it's a short hop from there to the beginnings of covert attempts to subvert other teams because you're competing for resources or in companies where there are competing efforts to try to get the same job done. Um, this really happens a lot and it's never a good idea, uh, although it's sometimes entertaining. It's at the end of the day, it's just bad for productivity. And then, of course, there's the accumulation of tech debt in silos. If silos that are not surveilled, except by the people inside of it, start to be um, dirty pretty quickly. So uh, they don't decruft very often. They don't take out you know, unused code because people are afraid that that unused code might break something. There might be a dependency that they can't see there. Um, there's a lack of tendency to document effectively because everybody on the team already knows what they need to know. And maybe there's an onboarding process where this is transmitted verbally to people, um, but that's not the same as making it easy to understand for anybody. Then what happens? Almost every company has code bases where everyone that knows how to do that code has left the company and they're all afraid to touch it now. And that's the worst form of technical debt. So the last thing is, of course, the expectations of your newest employees. Um, at the low end of of your scale of, for pay, you have to hire you know, emerging young engineers. Today, those engineers are used to a certain amount of transparency because they're digital natives. They grew up with the internet. And it is often quite um, saddening to them to learn how software is really built in these older companies. And often it, uh, this, this uh, lack of satisfaction will contribute to attrition of the newest employees. and um, or dissatisfaction with work. Um, so there's that to consider as well. So what is InnerSource? Well, first a bit about where we came from. Um, this is Tim O'Reilly and Brian Bellendorf on the right, Tim O'Reilly on the left. They co-founded a company called CollabNet in 2000. And the purpose of CollabNet was to teach companies, proprietary companies, how to build uh, their own software using open source methods inside the firewall. Brian is a co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation, which is the most successful open source project probably of all time in terms of reach. And uh, he was just so bullish on this method. Um, he thought that it would be great to teach it to companies. Their most famous, <clears throat> excuse me, their most famous um, success was HP, who went from 198 printer drivers that they were supporting because of lack of code reuse down to 10 which is, of course, a much more reasonable number to support. And they did that by adopting InnerSource through CollabNet. Unfortunately, CollabNet had a hard time in their sales cycle because anybody that wanted to get in the way of this happening could just say, well, you know, it's not like open source is going to win because in the early days of open source, you know, that was not a given that it was going to win. So then we won. So shortly after open source won, Every company in the world wanted to join the open source movement, but most of them really didn't know how. And uh, in my company that I worked for at the time, that was pretty apparent. And so I turned back to the inner source idea to get them collaborating effectively internally before we tried to do any more open source projects. And that, so I famously gave a keynote at OSCON in 2015 where I said that we were going to put our efforts into InnerSource, and that was a risky move at the time, um, but it's really, really paid off, as you will see. 
we also on that day um, handed out a few thousand copies of this booklet that we produced with O'Reilly. This booklet describes the first experiment that we tried at PayPal. It's only 26 pages long, so it's you know suitable to give to um, executives, and it is um, the most today the most downloaded non-code asset on GitHub. It's a very popular booklet. Uh, we had no idea how popular it was going to be at the time, but um, it tells that story and it tells some of the benefits that that team saw early on. It was actually published before the experiment was over, so there's more to the story, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now, we were not the only company that thought about doing Intersource. Um, in fact, all of these companies are, have talked publicly about their Intersource journey. And this represents just a small percentage of the number of companies that are at Intersource Commons. But they, not every company is talking about their Intersource efforts yet, but these, these all have. And as you can see, it's a pretty diverse and pretty name brandy kind of a group of people. So you can feel some confidence that this is working for somebody anyway. Um, so let me talk about what the Intersource Commons community is doing now to um, give you what you need to get started on your inner source journey. So first of all, there are books. These books were all funded by PayPal. The one on the left is the one I told you about that we gave away that's so popular. The middle one is, was written by a woman who's now a board member at Intersource Commons. And um, it is for people who think in terms of checklists, it's a fairly exhausting list of concerns, considerations when starting up an Intersource effort. And then Adopting Intersource, the pink book, is one that I co-wrote uh, in 2017 with Klaus Jan Stoll, who uh, is a professor of computer science. And he had written quite a few papers about the Intersource phenomenon before he met me, but nobody was reading them. And so getting an Intersource, an O'Reilly book out there has really increased the readership quite a bit. Um, it starts with an um, introduction chapter that's theory um, that Klaus wrote. Then there's six uh, case studies that we co-edited and the people who actually, you know, were the subjects of the case studies wrote them. And then at the end, there is a chapter that is my uh, description of how you get started, how you structure your first engagement with Intersource. So it's got a lot of practical information in it. You can get all of these books on intersourcecommons.org in PDF format. You can also order them as real books from O'Reilly. And the pink book is also acquirable through the company I work for now, which is called nearform.com. You can navigate to the inner source part. There's a, down at the bottom, there's a navigation map and inner source is one of the things you can click on. And there's a way that for you to order the book um, signed by me. There's also a book uh, by our fellow travelers, Baturgia, they are um, quants, you know, uh, statistics geeks, uh, and they started a company to do a better job of measuring things for the open source community. But they wrote a book about inner source projects. And they're also, by the way, the, um, the sponsors and hosts of this particular inner source summit. So um, this is worth downloading and having a read to. It talks quite a bit about measurement and metrics. And it's on the Intersource Commons website. Here's the Intersource Commons website. Um, if you haven't found it already, you should go immediately and ask for a Slack account. It's free, and that's how you get involved in the private conversations that we have private to Intersource Commons, conversations about how to implement Intersource and why and what you can get out of it. So that's a great thing to do. And um, now I need to talk about Chatham House Rules because Intersource Commons runs on Chatham House Rules. So Chatham House rules are a way to ensure that conversations that happen on Intersource Commons stay on Intersource Commons. So we've agreed as, a, as part of our um, code of conduct that we will not publicly shame or expose uh, any company or any individual that's asking questions on the Intersource Commons website um, or on the Intersource Commons Slack channel because we want people to feel free to ask questions without fear that they're going to be um, outed for not knowing the answers to those questions already. So there's no way that you can get brand um, damage from participating in intersourcecommons.org. And um, we've been doing it for five years now and we've, we've, we're still in good shape. Everybody gets why we do it. 
uh, I need to remind you that these presentations that you're going to watch today and tomorrow and the conversations that are happening in the chat and later in the Zoom breakout rooms, none of that is under this Chatham House rules. This is all public information, just so everybody's clear. But if you have a question that you need to ask that you can't ask publicly, by all means, ask for a Slack, chat, uh, Slack account and go ahead and ask that question and you'll be treated with fairness and civility, I promise. It's part of our hallmark. So we've also created a learning path, which is a series of tutorials. They were funded by PayPal, but created by the Intersource Commons community. And they're hosted both at O'Reilly, um, Safari U right now is where they're hosting their learning path, but we also have them at Intersource Commons. There is an introduction to Intersource that's suitable for executives that is an attempt to try to keep uh, brand dilution from happening inside your company. That's the thing where it shows up on a business plan, like maybe the CTO mentions Intersource and all of a sudden it cascades through all the business plans, but nobody knows what it is yet. And shortly after they get it on there, they decide they hate it because they've, they, <laughs> they've never tried it. Um, so this is an attempt to at least inoculate them so they understand what they're getting into. Um, there's also all the major roles of, of Intersource, the way that we practice it, that's you know, based on the Apache way. So the role for the contributor, the role of the trusted committer, and the role of the product owner. These are totally worth looking at. And there's also a workbook because not everybody learns by listening. There are detailed notes and also questions so you can test your own comprehension. So go have a look at that after you become a member of the Intersource Commons. There's also information about uh, the Intersource Patterns group work. This is an attempt to describe in a structured way all of the tricks and tips and mitigations that have worked for other companies to fix a problem in an Intersource implementation within a given culture, or in some cases, some of the failures that have happened. So we're hoping to eventually publish a book of patterns so that people can just flip through and find the one that applies to their work. And that's very interesting work to join. So if you have a pattern that's working for you, it's a good idea to submit it. And there's also a contributing MD wizard, which I'm exposing here. Um, it's a few years old, but I'm finding in my own consulting that most companies don't realize that it's a good idea to um, create a contributing MD file that sort of memorializes the working agreements between two sides of an inner source um, engagement, the silo side and the contributor side. It's a really good practice. And so this will help you get to a contributing MD file that you can use. Um, so, but check it out. So what else are we going to work on? Well, over at my employer, Nearform, we have a series of podcasts. Uh, we've done four, uh, well, we've done three, and we have one that's about to come out this week. And then we have um, quite a few of them that we've, that we've recorded that we're in the process of editing down. Um, they are useful conversations with real life people who got Intersource working in their company. So that might be of use to you. And you can find them in the same place <clears throat> as where you go to ask for uh, a copy of the book at nearform.com. We plan future summits. We've been doing two summits a year for five years now, and we'll continue to do that. There'll be an announcement a little bit later in this event about where the North American summit will be if we're allowed to do it in person. And in any case, who's sponsoring the next one. So that's great. Um, and now it's time to get back to work. So um, we will be moving along with the conference. Uh, if you haven't already opened the chat, open it now because I'm there and I'm very happy to answer your further questions in the remaining time before the next uh, talk starts. And, um, or I can give you back the time and you know come back in, it looks like just about two minutes and we'll be starting the next one. And lastly, I want to plug my company one more time, Nearform because not only do they underwrite my time working on Intersource Commons, but they also are, we are co-developing a series of products that would help you get through your Intersource journey. And some of them are engagement with me, but there are also other products that we offer, including a cultural inventory. Um, we can do bespoke coding if there's a piece of tooling that you need. And so I hope you'll have a look at that. Um, there also is my Twitter handle and uh, one more time the address of Intersource Commons where I hope you will join. 
So let me just thank you one more time for your attention. And I really look forward to the rest of this event and I hope you do too. And um, thank you so much for coming today and helping us out. Thanks to everybody who helped put this on, including the sponsors and hooray, happy InterSource Day. <laughs>